Hi, this is Estelle Erasmus, your host for Freelance Writing Direct. In this short, soundbite-filled podcast, I'll cover everything the freelance and creative writer and author needs to do to move forward with their writing, their creativity, and their career. Through conversations with guests, we'll cover tips, tricks and actionable strategies so join me every week and grow your business and build your craft with freelance writing direct and don't forget to subscribe rate and review on itunes and spotify Hi, everybody. It's Estelle Erasmus, and I'm so thrilled to announce that my book, Writing That Gets Noticed, Find Your Voice, Become a Better Storyteller, Get Published, is out and available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, IndieBound, and wherever books are sold. So I would love it if you'd pick up a copy, and I think you'll learn a lot. Thanks. Bye-bye. Welcome, everybody, to Freelance Writing Direct, and I'm your host, Estelle Erasmus, and I am so delighted to have Kevin Carey with us today. In this episode titled From Poetry to Middle Grade Fiction with Kevin Carey, and I want to tell you a little bit about Kevin. He's coordinator of creative writing at Salem State University. His books include The Beach People, The 115 to Penn Station, Jesus Was a Homeboy, which was an honor book for the Patterson Literary Prize, and Set in Stone is another book. His poems have appeared on the Writer's Almanac, on National Public Radio three times, and on the Academy of American Poets, Poem a Day. Kevin is also a playwright and filmmaker. He has co-directed and co-produced two documentaries about poets, All That Lies Between Us and Unburying Malcolm Miller. A crime novel, Murder in the Marsh, from Dark Stroke Books, was released in October 2020. A new middle grade novel, Junior Miles and the Junk Man, from Fitzroy Books, Regal House Publishing, and a co-written poetry collection, Olympus Heights, from Lily Poetry Review. So welcome to the program, Kevin. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. And we first connected, I think, when I was teaching a course for NYU on micro memoir and somebody connected us and you were a great speaker for the class. Well, thanks. Yeah, that was fun. It was fun to get the word out about Molecule Magazine and writing in tiny forms. And, you know, that that was a blast. Thank you for asking me to do that. My pleasure. Well, we're going to talk all about that. But first, you wrote this really delightful book, Junior Miles and the Junk Man. And it's a middle grade novel, but it has so many twists and turns that I felt it was very compelling. And it wasn't what I expected. I thought, oh, I'm going to read a kid's book, but it was really fascinating. And so what made you decide to write this story? And and how did you come up with the idea? And also, is the character of Junior a composite of anyone you know? (laughs) Well, I can tell you the genesis of it. It's clearly in my mind. We had taken my two children when they were young to an exhibit in Pittsfield, Massachusetts called Springs, Sprockets, and Pulleys. It's by a New York artist, Steve Gerberich. And it's all these junk figures that are connected on these pulleys and you press a button and they all move and sync like two people playing cards or a band or something. And there was one solitary figure kind of off in the distance. And I just started conjuring up this idea about a junk sculptor leaving a sculptor for his child and having it come alive and send him on these journeys. And I kind of put the idea away. And then a couple of months later, I was in Morristown, New Jersey, and the exhibit was in another museum a couple of years later. And so it, it kind of kept bugging me you know, to get this story out. And then I I had three different agents for it and they all loved it and couldn't sell it. And each iteration would change it from more of a YA novel to a middle grade novel. And I think it was, 
it had a little trouble finding its place and then finally it landed. So I had the pleasure of hanging out with Steve Gerberich about two months ago in his studio in Newburgh. And, and it was fascinating. He's a great guy and just so inventive. And so we, we did a little article together for the Brooklyn Rail about, you know, how it inspired me to get the book going. So it's, it's just so much fun to have this book out after so much time. How much in time? How many years? I, I think I've had this book in different iterations for eight to 10 years. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's- I mean, that, and that's, that's since the first completion of the first draft, right? And, but when, when I saw that exhibit, it's probably been 12 years, 14 years. I always liked the story. I always felt like it was this kind of mythical place that was resembled kind of where I grew up in Revere, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. And as far as Junior being a composite, yeah, there's experiences in there that I think I'd steal from a few different people. Maybe a little bit of myself snuck in there. But I, I liked the first person voice. I liked following the the narration in that voice. And that's what kept me going, having him tell you the story. It was a no- it's a novel, but it has like a memoirish aspect to it yeah. too, because it's his story and it's a real clear story of transformation. I'm not giving it all away, but you know, there's yeah, yeah. a transformation there. And it's so interesting because you have this background in poetry and you've written all these poetry books and I imagine it is a very different process from writing a poetry book, which is, again, the short form that Molecule specializes in, I suppose. I I think it could be longer poems. Um, And this kind of with this kind of book with a narrative arc and and with Mm -hmm. a lot of conflict. So how can you give a description of the two processes? I went to get an MFA years ago at Fairleigh Dickinson University, and I went in as a fiction writer. And I started hanging out with all these Jersey poets, and you know they kind of took me under their wing. And so I started writing this narrative poetry. It is narrative, you know. It is storytelling, even even my poetry. So the link is not that uncommon. I think you know I you know a lot of it's about myself. It's about things that happened to me, people I knew, places I went experiences I had. So I had that kind of memoir feel when I launched into this novel, I think. It was just a natural way of kind of letting someone tell you about their life, because that's kind of what I was doing in my poetry. You know, I I have a friend who used to always say, I may not be much, but I'm all I think about. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so I think I'm guilty of that with my poetry and maybe a little bit with this novel. You know that you know, write what you know, right? <laughs> so. That's definitely an artist's <laughs> motto because you have to be you have to think of that as a as a almost as important as the other aspects of your life because yeah. art has to have a priority in your life. And it's, it's, it's all best laid plans, right? I mean, I went in with this fiction drive and, and published really three out of the four books I published were poetry before I launched into that crime novel and then into this novel. So, you know, it's, it happens the way it's supposed to, if you let it happen, I think, you know, um, so, so tell me about genre switching, like what, had a change in your writing. And I know you indicated one thing to me before about certain language that you couldn't use. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, to the crime, from the poetry to the crime novel seemed like almost a more seamless move for me. Somebody that read that novel said it's a crime novel with a poetic soul. So there's a lot of poetry in it. A lot of the sentences and a lot of the narration I tried to stay poetic with, right? But now that I'm in the voice of a 12-year-old kid, you know, it, it gets a little more fine-tuned, you know? It's, it's, you have to, you can't be as free. I'm not me anymore. I'm this character, right? right. And I think that's what a good first person does. It, it almost makes you forget there's a writer and makes you believe in a character, right? So that was, a, that was the bigger switch for me than going through the crime though. Um, 
you know, what I thought was so interesting about Junior Miles and the Junkman is that you put a lot of conflict into the, into the book. Like right away, there was the inciting incident of his father becoming ill and mm. he's also getting bullied. And then the developer, I mean, it just keeps escalating. Yeah. Yeah. And so is that something that, you did with your crime novel or is that a craft technique from your work as a creative writing teacher that you've imbued in your book? Yeah, I, I think I'm always telling fiction writing students and story writing that you know, it's your story has to have the obstacles, right? right? You have to have something to root for your character to get through or get over or get past, right? Or defeat. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if it's if it's a clear sale from beginning to end, people get kind of bored, right? You know, yeah. even if the writing's beautiful, something has to be happening. And I think the other thing, too, is there has to be movement. You have to go from one place to another. You have to keep it in motion, right? Yeah. If you get too stagnant for too long at one point, well, there's a lot of books on the shelf and people will reach for another one, right? So those two things, I think the... Keeping obstacles in the way and keeping the uh, movement going helped me to get through both those novels. It's interesting. And you also took uh, a trope, like a road trip, and yeah. you put a different twist on it. You know, the two boys going, underage boys, and they're going on an odyssey of sorts. And it felt, you know, familiar, like, oh, okay, it's a road trip, but then you don't know what you're going to throw at them. And you definitely throw a lot of challenges to them, which again, as you said, it keeps the reader's interest and it keeps it very focused. And I felt it's sort of like you imbued adult concepts, but for a kid's book and it works it, because it keeps it interesting. Yeah. You know, and I think part of that still was that I really wasn't sure I was writing a kid's book when I started this. And I think what was in the back of my head was just to tell the story that was coming to me. And, and it might have been a little older in some of the iterations earlier, but I liked that it took that route and that it did that because it kept some of the fictional tricks alive, right? And I, you know, and it may be part of the problem that I had early on is that it, it didn't fit a niche. And there were some things going on that, that weren't typically middle grade or weren't typically YA at the time. And, but I, I think you have to just write what you write and then worry about that after. And it and, wasn't like sex, drugs, and murder. Yeah. It wasn't no, there. no, no, no. It wasn't, it wasn't anything like the crime yeah. novel. It wasn't, you know. But it, it's it, to, to me, it was a story that came out pretty easily in the first draft and obviously took a long time to get it where it is. But I, And again, I was following that voice. And when I got stuck, it was always let the voice tell you another story, let the voice bring you to another memory, let the voice tell you something that he knows. And that that was the way to keep it rolling for me. Interesting. Yeah. And so tell me about your role with Molecule and how that kind of originated. And a little, you could tell the audience what Molecule is and a little bit about Yeah, it. Molecule, a tiny lit mag. We publish uh, 50 pieces an issue. Everything is 50 words or less. And there's a little design to that. We looked up the smallest particle is in a cube, and one side of that cube is 50 molecules. So there's science behind it, believe it or not. And, <laughs> and the 24-word limit on the bio was so many molecules in a drop of coffee or something. I don't know. I, I can't remember exactly why we came up with that reason. But we published two issues a year. And everything is 50 words or less, drama, poetry, prose, interviews, which are really cool in 50 words, and book reviews. And MP Carver, a colleague of mine, came to me with the idea, and we started kicking it around. And we're the same two editors that started it five years ago. And, you know, we've had people like yourself and others jump in and help us out. And we're excited about it. We think we're at a good point. And it's a, it's a popular genre that small little bits of writing and trying to get something into 50 words. And a lot of them are funny and irreverent and some are sad and serious. And it, it's a really nice mix. And 
it seems to be more poetry heavy because of the nature of the beast and being so small. But we get a lot of prose and we get wonderful plays in 50 words. And we're excited. We we're looking to make all the issues in print available soon. There's also photos and perhaps illustrations, right? People yeah, photos of tiny things. Yeah, tiny things. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny. We'll be looking through things and we'll go, oh, that's nice. It's just not tiny enough. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it has to be tiny. That's yeah, tiny. of something tiny, you know. Um, and tell me about the interviews, like how that works. Well, they're usually one question and an answer, right? And sometimes two questions and an answer. We have one in this issue from Lulu Miller, who does the NPR science show. And it's it's two questions and it's really succinct and beautiful. And, you know, it's amazing what you can learn about somebody in, in two quick sentences, right? And <laughs> that includes the question, right? So the 50 words includes the question. So we thought that was going to be a real challenge that we wouldn't get many of those, but people are interested in doing it. What are some of the mistakes that people have made the submission, aside from too much, too many words, 51, 52? Yeah, was... oftentimes we get poems that are 50 words and two lines, and it's a 30-line poem, you know? So sometimes people just forget to read the guidelines carefully. I see sometimes is that people try and get too, too poetic, in a way, mm. that this has to be a very kind of highfalutin concept to work, Right. When really it's the opposite. It's the concrete, detailed, humorous things that that jump out at us, right? This idea that that you can almost we're big fans of puns too, right? And so it, it isn't that we're looking for everything humorous, but it has to just be language that doesn't feel like it's trying too hard, you know, that that feels constrained. Yeah, that academic erudite. Right, that we don't want it way up here. We want it right the heart, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I think sometimes people feel like they have to do that because they have so few words, when really it's the opposite that jumps out and strikes us. Like, be real, be honest, be direct, be spontaneous, be funny. Does sensory language work really well for those short pieces? You know, the, the touch, taste, hear, smell. Yeah, and you know everything's in details right you know it's like if you have the right details and you you have that little tone you know every once in a while we'll get like a piece and we'll say oh this guy gets us like right. it has this irreverent tone to it or this tone that's just isn't afraid to take a chance and, and be a little dangerous or funny and you know so i i think we're starting to see the molecule style just kind of being formed with each issue you that's know, interesting. Uh, is there uh, something that you will read that's an immediate no, a subject? I don't think there's anything taboo. We were just joking the other day that, oh, we're going to get hate mail for this issue. <laughs> <laughs> and not not for anything like danger, too dangerous or anything racist, certainly not. And some things that we thought were really funny and we're like, oh, is someone going to get offended by this? I don't know. Maybe we'll have to see. So we like that. We like the edge, right? Take a chance. So I, I don't think we would say there's nothing you, that, that there's something that you can't send us. You don't pay right now, the writers, right? No, we don't pay. Yeah, we're a, a mom and pop organization here. So, you know, um, it's, it's just the two of us. Uh, so I always say to my students, sometimes the public, you know, obviously if they're writing an article, if they're writing a long, long essay, you want to get paid for that. For short, short pieces, there could be benefits. You know, you could start getting a piece of your memoir out there. It's something that you could show people with the more, you know, that it's a prestigious publication. Do you submit any of the pieces for awards? Do you we do. We do the push cards every year out of it. Yeah. So um, that's something. You know, and, that's, uh, yeah. That's yeah. Something. And I've seen not because of us, but uh, simultaneously, I've seen other publications popping up. There's one called Tiny Molecules, I think. So I think the genre appeals to people that, yeah. that quick get in and out, you know, idea of like how poetic or how dramatic or how dangerous can I be in 50 words, right? right. 
So. And I mean, the New York Times has its very popular tiny love stories, which a lot of my yeah. and I've been in and a lot of people are in. Yeah, yeah. And that's a hundred words or less. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's right in the, that's why I started teaching about it. Yeah, we get a lot, but it's really manageable when everything's only 50 words, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's actually <laughs> harder to write short than to write long. So writing yeah. short is a real good test of a writer's skill at editing and making sure that they can convey what they're trying to say. Do you recommend yeah. that people take pieces that maybe they haven't been able to sell or pieces of a book that they're working on and make that into a, an item for Molecule? Well, yeah, you know, I think it's always interesting to look at at what you've created if you're struggling finding a home for it or where it goes. And, you know, I, I had a short story years ago that that was the best short story I've ever written. And, and it bounced around and made some noise and won some things. And it started out as a terrible poem. It was a poem I just couldn't make work. And I kept trying and I kept beating it against the wall and it just... It just wasn't working. It was about a my father digging himself up from the grave and sitting down at Thanksgiving dinner with everybody. And it was dark and meant to be humorous and, and weird. And and it just, it didn't work as a poem. And when I jumped into it and expanded it and gave it some narrative arc, it, it, it found what it was supposed to be. So, you know, I, you know, somebody, I feel fortunate that I write in different genres, but Sometimes I'm not sure where it's supposed to fit, this idea that I have, right? So it's, you know, it's trial and error like everything else. You try it out and think yeah. this should be a play or this should be a short story or this should be a poem. And it's a good thing to have. Sometimes I have too many things boiling and I can't get anything done <laughs> until I concentrate on one thing. But but I'm grateful for it because I don't I don't feel like I ever don't have something to write. Yeah. Uh, I, I always have something to write. That's great. Yeah. What yeah. about pitfalls for writing a children's book? Like, are there, if people are writing their own children's book, are there any pitfalls or things that you should want to tell them, you know, like watch out for or do yeah. this? You know? Take the swears out. I know that. Uh, <laughs> Can't swear. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. This is the first one I've written, you know, and to me it it had such a foundation in 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 just being a story that was being told. And then I found, you know, with these different agents and different iterations of it, people would make suggestions and I was kind of learning along the way of that that you have to think about your audience a little bit. And I ask writers this a lot. I'm involved in the writer series at the university here. And, you know, the fun part of my job is I get to hang out with these writers and talk to them and ask them questions at the readings. And sometimes I ask them, do you think about your audience when you write? Are you thinking about who I envision reading this? And what do they say? Some of them do and some of them don't. You know, some people just like, oh, this is a story I'm writing and it'll find its audience afterwards. I write thinking about reading it to people, not necessarily a certain type of person or a certain type of audience, but I read everything I write out loud at some point, I walk around the house with it, or I print it out and read it. And that's just a process that I always do. And I think about what's this going to sound like if I'm reading it, especially with poetry, right? And that really helps me to kind of hear it. And imagine myself reading it somewhere and imagining a reaction from that. The problem with that is you write this wonderfully funny line and there's dead silence <laughs> in the hall. Or you write this really sad line and somebody laughs. So, I mean, it's always a risk as a writer, isn't it? You, you're putting yourself out there and people can say good things or, or not so good things about it. That's part of the game.
It's interesting. You have that poetry yeah. background. I have a music background. And so yeah. I do the same thing as I read my work aloud because yeah. it's, for me, words are like music. Yeah. And, so you uh, have that musicality to the rhythm of your writing, right? Exactly. You hear the rhythm. You hear where something is clunky. It's yeah. like you're psychically scoring it as you work. <laughs> and yeah. Like, I mean, that, that's so true because I, I think that if it's working in your ear and you're bouncing along with it, chances are it's pretty good, right? Yes. That it's, yeah. that it's working in a way rhythmically that makes it sound. And it's all about no hiccups, right? You, right. you just want people reading along and not having to pause for a reason or, or stop or not understand something. It's really about flow. When yeah, so yeah. I, I know that I am in a state of flow when I lose track of time and I'm working and I don't like, I'm just so into what I'm doing. And that happens when I'm reading, right? So when I read your book, I, it just, the time went and I was, Oh, you know, I thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And so what, is next for you now? Is there another genre you're going to explore or are you going to go back to a certain one? I have a plan for a few things. I wrote a play with a, a friend of mine, R.G. Evans, another poet. We were in an MFA program together and we've decided to shoot the play as a movie, a 60 minute movie next spring. And it's called the MFA, the Terminal Degree. And it's a comedy murder mystery wow. about an MFA program. So that's next spring, we're going to shoot that in a weekend in New Jersey. And, and then I'm writing a novel with a friend of mine. It's kind of a high concept thriller. And I have several pages of another middle grade novel in the works. But I'm on sabbatical in the spring, so I'm actually getting paid to take the semester off. Oh, that's So fantastic. I'm saving the middle grade novel for the spring and then concentrating on these other two projects so for the mfa i mean obviously you've learned a lot of craft you work with craft yeah. you have some actionable writing tips for my listeners and viewers who are actually digging into writing their own books or their own pieces what can you do? yeah i i mean the first thing that comes to mind is that i don't think i've ever written anything that turned out to be any good without talking to someone else about it uh, whether it's in a writer's group or whether I was in an MFA program or, or just friends that I trust will be honest with me, right? So I need that. I need to bounce it at some point off of somebody because left to me, it's either not that good and I'm giving it too much credit or uh, maybe I'm not appreciating it enough, you know? So uh, I, I still... After a lot of years of doing this, I still have trouble trusting my own work without having someone that I can confide in, you know? And it doesn't mean that I, I take all the advice that people give me. I tell my students in workshop, look, thank everybody for the advice and then go home and do what you want. So it, it isn't always going to jive with you, but it does help you rethink it, Right. If I go to a writer's group, there's a Salem writer's group near us that is a wonderful group. It's been going for years. If I pass a poem to that group, there's no shortage of opinions. And then I come home and it makes me rethink it. And some of the opinions work for me and some of them don't. And But it, it, it's a different poem the next day than it was the day before. That's one thing I would do. Find someone, even if it's one person that you share manuscripts with or somebody that you trust to be honest with you that we'll look at it critically because you know, that and what really about helps writing? well i mean the old axiom is to is to write what you know but if you don't know it you have to go out and find it out right you yeah. have to research you want to write that novel about you know king arthur and the round table you got to go out and do you do your due diligence do your research and find your history but i'm always telling people especially younger writers what's around you right where did you grow up and what was your neighborhood like and who were your friends in school? And I, I've stolen so much fact for my fiction over the years, right? And, and I've I've used amalgamations of characters and 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 pieces of place that I know. I mean, if you pay attention to the world around you, you don't really have to go anywhere. Your stories are all around you. 
And I, I think like stumbling into that exhibit of Steve Gerberich, like that being open to other forms of art inspiring. I'm sure you feel it with music and how you can put an LP on and something comes to you that you want to write, right? Because mm -hmm. of the music. And so art, I think, is great. Visit museums, you know, talk to other artists that are doing things because the inspiration is flowing all around you. And it's work. If you're serious about it, you got to put your butt in the seat as many times as you can during the week, right? Do you write every day? I don't write every day, but I, I look at something. I might edit something. I might generate something on another day. You know, the summer is a big time for me because I do have a full-time job at the, at the university. It doesn't mean I don't write during the school year, but the summer I get bigger chunks of time. So I'm always thinking about what I'm going to do in the summer. Like, this is started. This is beginning. You know, I'm, I'm creeping along during the semester. And then when the summer hits, I can really make some progress. I will say this. When I'm generating something, that's the hardest work. When I'm starting on chapter one or the first line of a poem, whatever it is, that's the hardest part. But the joy of the writing comes when I'm trying to edit that draft and make that work. When I'm trying to tighten everything up. Yeah. You know, that's the most fun for me. Talk to me about tightening up. Like, what do you do? You don't want to be beating people over the head with a big mallet to get what you're saying. So there's oftentimes, if you have a longer draft of something, you'll, you'll be able to pick out repetition that's unnecessary, right? Or you'll, you'll, you'll find yourself kind of over-explaining something. Or you've said it, move on, say the next thing, right? Don't get stuck in dwelling on it and worrying about whether the person reading it is going to get it. Everything I write, I write it, then I print it out, and I walk around, or I go somewhere, and I read it out loud, and I edit as I'm reading it, and then I put it back in the computer, and I do that process over and over again. Oh, interesting. So yeah. I may be wasting too much paper, but... <laughs> I'm uh, a big paper <laughs> waster, too. I understand uh, that. I, yeah. I'm always printing everything. But, but if I have something in my bag that feels hefty and... <laughs> You know, like I've done my, and I'm going to sit down in a coffee shop. I do like going to coffee shops to edit because writing can be lonely. You know, it and, uh, it it's nice to have some ambient sound and run into somebody, you know, uh, you know, so I do, I do frequent either in the office here or coffee shop or sitting at home, but, and, and that's the process for me. I have a new aspect of the freelance writing direct and I'm going to, I ask my guests like, what they are reading now and something that they're watching on either TV or the movies mm. or TikTok and something you're buying just to kind of open it up for some interesting new information. Well, the last the last couple of books I bought were the Cormac McCarthy books, the new one, uh, The Passenger and Stella Maris. Um, those were fantastic. And he just passed away after a wonderful career. And then a few, I don't know how many months ago, I listened to that podcast, Once Upon a Time at Bennington College. It was about all these writers that went to Bennington College in the 80s. And a lot of them I hadn't read, like Jonathan Lethem and Brett Easton Ellis and Donna Tart and Jill Eisenstadt. But my class, Don DeLillo, I just read a book called Silence. And I read the graphic novel, from Octavia Butler, A Parable of a Sower, that I'm going to use in class. Kevin, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. I yeah. know that people can find you on your website, kevincarrywriter.com, and I'll put that in the show notes, as well as the social media links for all your social media. And the best of luck to you with your wonderful book coming out in the fall and your poetry book coming out. It's been great speaking with you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Estelle. I really appreciate it. Follow me at EstelleSErasmus.com on my website and on social media, which is Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter at Estelle S. Erasmus. And we're now on YouTube for Freelance Writing Direct. Follow along and soon everyone will be reading what you're writing.